This is call, a library that will change the way that you think about function invocations. Uh, before I start this presentation, I just want to give a brief introduction. I think most of you here know me by now. I've been coming to this conference for about, I think, 11 years, right, since the start. 11, 12 years. I missed two years. Uh, I'm Matt Calabrese. Uh, I've been participating in the Boost community for just about the same amount of time. Uh, I'm currently a software engineer at Google. Uh, formerly, I was in the game industry. And the main thing that I do during development is uh, low-level C++ libraries. I'm also a member of the C++ Standards Committee. I've been going to committee meetings for about uh, three years now. Uh, a note about this title. It's, the subtitle is a library that will change the way you think about function invocations. The reason why it has that title is because it changed the way that I personally think about function invocations. And I'm hoping that it will change the way everybody else thinks about them. But uh, consider it a challenge. Oh, let's skip this here. OK, so first of all, there's the, the target audience for this session is primarily people who are already used to working with tuples and variants in C++. Uh, I've, I've put a lot of effort into making the slides really easy to understand if you don't have that experience. But uh, please ask questions uh, if, if you're not able to follow what's going on. Uh, this library is currently in research mode. Uh, almost all of what you're going to see in this talk is going to change in the next few months. Uh, the names are currently changing. I've actually changed a whole bunch of names of functions uh, while creating these slides. <laughs> uh, currently, this only works on uh, bleeding edge Clang, or at least that's the only thing I'm testing on it right on right now. I had to jump back and forth between Clang and GCC uh, while they were updating for C++17 in order to get this to work and tested. Uh, currently requires various features, such as context for lambdas, fold expressions, inline variables, template auto if context for std variant is an optional requirement. But if you're not using std variant, there's not much use to this library. Um, an additional disclaimer, this session is, is slotted for two full sessions, which is a full three-hour talk. Originally, this was going to be 90 minutes. Uh, I requested additional time. I do not think I'm going to be able to take up a full three hours, so uh, it may be that we have extra time at the end, in which case I do have a couple of ideas planned that will help us fill time. Uh, one more disclaimer. This library is going to blow your mind. <laughs> Maybe. If not by uh, the, the content in the talk, by these awesome uh, slide transitions. <laughs> OK, so what will this talk cover? Uh, basically, the whole idea of this library is to simplify how you interact and on a day-to-day -day basis with your tuple invariant types. And this is not just um, the standard tuple invariant types, but your own. Uh, it provide, the library also provides just very general facilities to jump between the compile time and the runtime world back and forth. And at the end of the talk, I'll talk about a, a little bit about the future direction that, and the plans that I have for this library. Uh, the origin of this library is actually from a standards paper that I wrote uh, last year called A Single Generalization of std Invoke, std Apply, and std Visit. Uh, has anybody in this room actually read this paper? I see four hands, which I think is more than the amount of people in the standards committee who read this paper. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the most, if, you, if you're curious, the most recent uh, revision can be found at wg21.link slash p0376. Currently, it's at re revision zero, but if you happen to be watching this online or something, this is how you'll be able to get to the most recent version. Uh, so yeah. the. The talk that I'm presenting right now actually diverges a little bit from what was in the original paper. Uh, most of the things are, or all of the things, are improvements to what uh, was done in the paper. Uh, it includes implementation changes and also just uh, more power has been added to the library in terms of things that you can do. Uh, I've sort of shifted after writing this paper to, instead of proposing it for the standard, first trying to get it into Boost. I really value the, uh, the Boost review process. And I think it's a, a really good idea for anybody who's proposing stuff into the standard to first have it kind of get vetted through Boost, get it distilled down into the quality parts that you want, and then submit it to the standard library. That's sort of a principle that, um, that I stand by. And you know, I just think it's a good general practice. Uh, 
And I, yeah, I do not plan on revising this paper until it's actually in Boost, gets some experience, assuming it actually gets in Boost. Yeah, and I may actually turn this into a language proposal rather than a library proposal. So uh, before I go into the actual details of the library, I'm going to talk about the title of the paper. So the title of the paper was A Single Generalization of Stid Invoke, Stid Apply, and Stid Visit. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page, I think we all need to know exactly what Stid Invoke, Stid Apply, and Stid Visit are. Uh, how many people are already familiar with Stid Invoke? Good. Most of the people in this room, which is kind of rare for <laughs> conferences, but I guess not for this one. So uh, I'll refresh anyway. So std invoke is a higher order function that takes an invocable and n arguments and returns the result of calling the invocable with those arguments. Now, does anybody know why you wouldn't just call the function directly when it has a definition like this? It also works with stuff like member function pointers. Right. So Victoria is bringing up the point that it also works with things like member function pointers. So that's the general idea. Not all invocables have a function call operator. But the notion of invocable in the standard is not a function object. They're two distinct things. And so specifically, an invocable is a function object or a pointer to member in general. And if it happens to be a pointer to member, it treats the first argument to the function as the this pointer. So an example of, of this in practice is if you've ever used std function, uh, you can actually bind a member function to the std function. And the this type of the, of the um, of the type that you're using will be just be the first parameter of the, uh, of the function signature that you give to std function as an explicit template argument. Everything works perfectly fine. std function isn't the only thing that uses this. Uh, a lot of facilities in the standard library use this, such as uh, std apply, std visit now uses it. Uh, bind, I believe, used it. I think bind is the original reason why it was introduced. So you might wonder. Uh, why do we have this kind of unique std invoke thing? Why can't you just invoke um, uh, pointers to member directly? Why do we need this kind of magical facility just to do it? So there's a, a, a paper that's currently in, it has been going through the mailings and was presented in Olu by Barry Revzin, which is to do exactly this. It's to, it's to turn the std invoke function into just a function call operator that works on member function pointers and member object pointers. It was presented earlier, it didn't reach consensus for you know, various reasons that can't really talk about, but. <laughs> I, I can think of a few reasons why not. But yeah. I wasn't in the room for that discussion. You should read the minutes. I should. Mm -hmm. OK, so. Say abominable functions? It has nothing to do with abominable functions, but. <laughs> so. Uh, Moving on, uh, before we get going, we're going to talk about, I want to make sure we're on the same page. When I talk about a product type, does, it, does everybody know that what a product type is? Do I have to read through this slide? I'll read through it anyway. <laughs> so a product type is just any type that contains the state of n different types. A good example of that is a std tuple. It's a variadic template. It takes, t and it, it takes a, a variadic list of t's. And it contains the state of each one of those t's. So overall, the number of states that the tuple can be in is the number of states that each of the t's can be in multiplied together. Uh, you could also think of a struct as a kind of product type, uh, although we don't generally interact with it in, in such a manner like with the same types of generalized facilities that we do with a tuple. Uh, in C17, we introduced this facility called std apply. This is the, the second part in the title of the paper. Uh, what std apply is, is it's a high order function that takes a function object as the, or an invocable as the first parameter, and it gets a tuple as a second parameter, and it expands out the tuple and passes all of the elements of the tuple as function arguments. So a quick example usage of this is just auto args equals std make tuple, one, two, three. And when you pass, I have some hypothetical function object called foo. You pass that to std apply with args, and it'll expand it out. And the comment above just describes exactly what happens. It's equivalent to just calling foo with one, two, and three. And it might not be obvious why you would do this, but the general time that this comes up is if you're working in generic libraries, and your types that are being, the, the types, the tuples that are being created are, are dynamic in terms of um, the, the input types of your of your generic algorithms. So there's not normally an actual name for your for your types. So how do other languages deal with unpacking tuples? So if you look at Python, uh, 
it's actually very easy. You just create a tuple type, and you call the function, and you use this little asterisk, and you just pass in asterisk args. And it'll expand everything out as individual function parameters. So if we compare that to C++, it's not too bad. I think the Python's a little bit more concise, but uh, the C++ is, is pretty much just as readable. Moving on, though, we get into slightly more complicated cases. If you look at what Python does, uh, it's, it's, it's really powerful in the sense that you can expand out your tuple anywhere in an, any arbitrary place in, existing, in an existing argument list. So for instance, if you have a concrete argument known first and you only want the trailing arguments to be expanded, you can just do one comma asterisk args and it just works. Does anybody know how to do this in C++ with just did apply? Tuple cat's a good answer. I guess you could do that. You can tuple cat the one with the, with the arguments. <coughs> or you can create a lambda. Yep. The example I'm showing here is you create a lambda. By the way, if foo, if foo is overloaded, even in the first case, you need this kind of line. If foo is overloaded, ev the, the comment was if foo is overloaded, even in the first case, you'd need this lambda. Yes. <laughs> So this is, this is uh, getting kind of crazy. It's, it, I, I hope people are seeing that you know, this is a relatively simple thing. This is a relatively complicated thing. Even if you don't have much experience with tuples, uh, to me, this kind of is a, is a smell. And it's indicative that, that maybe we're going in the wrong direction with the types of uh, facilities that we're standardizing. If we go further, you can have more complicated cases. This one's a little bit more contrived. but just for the sake of argument, let's see what it looks like in C++ if we had to do it manually. <laughs> Things start looking way more complicated. You end up having to have nested lambdas. I'm sure there are other solutions. You could obviously use like tuple cat and things, but ultimately, all you really want to express is this. You, you have some arguments. You have some that come from an expansion of a tuple. Other arguments, other things that come expanded from, expanded from a tuple. You should just be able to express it like that. And we don't currently have facilities in the language for this. Um, here, you're not providing anything. Um, is it possible to even perfect forwarding in that case? You, you could do. Capture the other yeah, so the comment is it's not doing perfect forwarding. This is basically just for the slides. Uh, doing perfect forwarding is just too much. It's possible. It is definitely possible. So if you wanted to do perfect forwarding here, uh, you would have to do auto ampersand ampersand. And you can, get, you can use the decal type of, of args to get back the reference type, and you can static cast to that. Oh, you're, that's a good point. So the comment there is that args has been captured as an L value reference in the innermost scope. So even then, the, uh, I, I think you're correct. So, so it probably would not work. So, so it's true. You may not even be able to perfect forward there. So I think the point is, wh what we're doing is we're coming up with more and more convoluted tricks and ways to try to actually get this to work. This already doesn't perfect forward. And all of the solutions that we're coming up with are just even, even worse than what we have here. So ultimately, std apply is great. But in the end, it's kind of limited. You can only expand out a single tuple occupying the full argument list. So if those examples were a little bit too abstract. Here's like a, a more practical example. This is something that I've run into multiple times. I have some kind of an output function that takes an O stream followed by a bunch of things I want to output. Uh, this is a fold expression. I think most people here have already seen them by now, this point in the week. Um, and then you just have a whole bunch of things that you want to output. And you have them in a tuple. And then you want to just go and output them all using this function output. And Instead of being able to just say, output this, followed by your expanded uh, tuple, you have to create this verbose lambda and then pass args. So to me, this is indicative of, of us going down the wrong direction with our, with our tuples. Maybe we should have had language level tuples. Or if we didn't have language level tuples, at least had some way to expand our tuples out uh, directly in the argument list. Moving away from product types for a second. We'll go to some types. So some types are where a product type was uh, capable of containing one of, e uh, one of each of all of the Ts. This contains exactly one of all of the contained types 
at any given point in time. Uh, std variant was introduced in C17, and it's the it's the way that we it's the way that we implement uh, sometimes in C++ now. We've had uh, boost variant since uh, 2003. Prior to so prior to std variant, we've been using boost variant. Uh, and the facility std visit is the second part of my, uh, or the last part of the, uh, the title of my original paper. And so std visit is a, is a facility that was standardized in, in C17. It's basically a hybrid function that takes an invocable and end std variants, and it returns the result of calling the invocable with the currently active alternative of each variant as a separate argument. Now that's really verbose, but here's a quick example. It's actually not that complicated. You have a std variant of three different types. Here there's thief, bot, rope. We call it an enemy and we store a rope inside the enemy. And we call visit on this attack function, which I haven't described, but this would be a function, function object that is overloaded or a template that can be callable with either a thief or a bot or a rope. And it will forward, forward along the, the result after calling it. So how does std visit work uh, internally? So it's basically analogous to, a nested, in, to nested switch statements. If you, if you only pass one variant, it's a single switch statement. Uh, in practice, it's not actually implemented with a switch, switch statement, but it's a good approximation of, of what happens. So if we examine std visit here, we take std visit, we pass it attack, and we pass it this variant. What it effectively uh, expands out to is a switch over the, the index discriminator of the variant. And then for the zeroth case, which corresponds to the thief, it'll call attack and cast out the zeroth element of the variant, which is the thief, and call the function. And we have a different way handling each of the cases. And one thing to note is that because this is a part of a function and it's returning all the results, all the return types of these overloaded function calls must be the same. And in the standard, if, you do not, if they're not all the same, then your program is ill-formed. Okay, so more advanced uses of std visit. This kind of goes along the same direction that I was talking about with my, um, with my std apply examples and kind of some of the drawbacks of, of std visit. Uh, imagine you have now a binary function where one of your arguments is a variant and the other one is just known concrete at compile time. Uh, what you'd like to be able to do is just say that you want to call fight with the concrete type and then the expanded version of the enemy. But instead, you have to write this lambda here to create and bind in one of your objects and then forward along your call to the enemy. More practical example. Okay. So let's, let's, let's use std visit in just our day-to-day -day code. Imagine you have to write a generic serialized function for a variant and you know for a fact that all of, the, all of the alternatives that are contained are already serializable. You have this serialize, serialize function. This is basically like a boost serialize uh, analog. Uh, can anybody tell me a strategy for serializing a variant here? Visit and serialize the inner thing? Visit and serialize the inner thing? Yeah, but if you're, if you're eventually going to read it back, you're going to need probably a little bit more information than that. Right. So what we're going to have to do is effectively serialize a discriminator, and then we visit and we serialize out the currently active element of the variant. And so this is a very general uh, serialization function for a variant. Works perfectly fine. OK. Now let's implement the reverse side of this. Need to write a deserialize, deserialize function for a std variant. Starts out very easy. We have an index. We read in the value of the index, and now what goes here? Does anybody know? There's no way to specify the variant from the index. There's no way to specify the variant from the index. Yeah. Michael? Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but you, you in essence, compare the um, static version of the, the index to what has been passed in, and then based upon that type, you can then call a function that will reform the type into variant. Right. OK, so Mike, uh, Michael gave a, a very long description of what you would Sorry. have to do, <laughs> which I am not going to repeat. But the point is, it's very complicated, and it's not something that you can exactly inline here. <laughs> I'd argue that a useful facility is missing. <laughs> 
So a summary of, of my personal view of, of support for algebraic data types in C++. We have, so, we have std tuple, which is a decent product type. std variance, a decent sum type. But we have very minimal facilities for actually interacting with these, uh, with these algebraic data types. And uh, I think the serialization uh, example is, is a really common everyday thing. And it's really embarrassing that we don't have an easy way to implement it. So what is call? Obviously, it's going to have solutions to all of these problems. Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving this talk. But <laughs> I find that call is, is a really difficult library to explain. Uh, so I'm going to just give out a bunch of examples and a bunch of different explanations. And I have a feeling that different people will be able to latch on to different definitions that I give. Uh, so if, if, if one doesn't really make much sense to you, then hopefully one of the other ones will. So the first description I can give is call is a library that allows a user to dynamically generate a function's argument list in whole or in part directly at the call site. So this is the most formal definition. So the general idea of call is that you can give it a description of your argument list rather than the argument list itself. And, it, and this description is capable of telling uh, the internal function where and when it should expand individual pieces. But that's kind of like a convoluted explanation. There's no example. It's kind of hard to relate to that. Uh, my favorite definition is the one that comes up. It's by a different nerd. It's by Jeff Snyder, who is at this conference. And he likes to describe it as to apply on crack. So an example of this is here's one of our earlier examples. I had that output example. Remember how it was very complicated to do std apply. You had to create a lambda and then pass along the arguments. What the std call or what the proposed std call library allows you to do is simply this. Create your lamb you create your tuple, invoke this higher order function called call, pass it output, which passes along as normal, pass it std c out, which passes along, or pass it output, which is a function object, you pass it std c out, which passes which goes along as normal. Then use this little notation here, unpack of args. And all this does is a little placeholder that captures args by reference. And it tells the call algorithm, hey, you should expand this tuple. And so the point of this is it allows us to write our function calls a little bit more naturally. And rather than having to create lambdas to, uh, to expand things out in various places, you just create descriptions. So looking back to one of our earlier Python examples, this was the really complicated one that resulted in a whole bunch of nested lambdas. When you have a facility that, like the one that I just showed on the previous slide, well, here's the, here's the old one for reference. You no longer need to do this. You can now turn it into a very simple expression. You can now call foo, pass again a concrete argument, unpacked arg zero, unpacked arg ones, pretend I actually wrote a zero here and a one here. <laughs> And this looks surprisingly similar to the Python example. It's almost as concise. And we could even go a step further than that. And if you create your function object in a fancy little way, if you inherit from a CRT, CRTP base, you can actually get it so that way any time you call your function, you can use these little placeholders. So the next way I describe call is that it's magic. It can do things that you didn't think were possible before. So one example is you can use call to access a tuple with a runtime index. So in this example, I have a tuple. It has two elements, a cat and a dog. And at runtime, a user uh, decides which animal he wants to pet. I'm sorry, these examples are terrible. <laughs> so here, with eat, that's good. That's a good idea. I'll change it. So, <laughs> so here, we read in an index. And obviously, the, the user specified uh, zero for cat because nobody else wants, nobody wants to pet dogs. And so <laughs> all we do is we call pet with prov access tuple, give it the animal, give it the animals, and we give it the index, and it expands out to that corresponding element. So this, does this seem weird to anybody? Like, does anybody have an idea of how this is implemented? Exactly. It's, it's exactly the same way that you implement a variant. Uh, it could be a switch, or it could be a, a lookup table of concept for function pointers, anything like that. 
pet here is a special function, yeah. So for most of the remaining slides in this section, uh, assume that anytime you see something like prov or something that looks like a, a magical thing, I'll call it out, but these are, these are magical functions, yes. And the return type of text is double in its variant of the... No, because... Keep that in mind. <laughs> so, so the question is, the return value of this is a variant. And I assume what you're saying is, is it a variant of all the possible overload paths? Is that, is that the assumption you're making? A variant of the, all the types in the tuple. A variant of all the types in the tuple. Well, it's the return type of the animal pet. No, because it would be a variant of the Because you're petting the thing. Yeah, so, yeah, the result of pet of all the types. Right. Of all the types. But it's probably just a span variant of that. <laughs> so, so you're on to a good you're on to a good point is what is the return type of this, right? So we know that this expression is going to resolve to either a cat or a dog. That means that pet needs to be callable with both, or I should say in either in different contexts, either a cat or a dog. So if each of these overloads has different return types, what should the return type of this overall expression be? It might be confusing because pet is both a noun and a verb, but yes. Okay, we're deserializing our cat and dog. So the answer is, for the moment right now, if those do not have the same return type, substitution will fail. But keep that in mind, there are actually ways to get different behavior out of this. So we said call was std apply on crack, it's also std visit on crack. So imagine you have a std variant, this time rats and bats. And you have a player kind of keeping with the, the theme of this being a game. And you want to have the hero attack the bat. So you have this function called fight. It's a binary function. And it takes the player and it takes the, uh, the thing that it's attacking. So you have, to do the, you have to create a lambda, just like in the apply version. With call, it's much more simple. You just write fight of the hero and active alternative of the enemy. So all this does behind the scenes is it will create one of these lambdas for you. And it does that because it, it knows exactly which thing you want to expand because it has this little placeholder here. It's also composable. Let's say you have a tuple of variants and you want to expand out the every single active element of the tuple of variants. It's a simple syntax for that. You just write unpack the tuple and then this little bar here uh, basically states that for each element that's unpacked, pass it along to the active alternative fun of function. So ultimately what foo gets is, in this case is dog and cat because the two things we initialized it with were dog and cat. Call is also a way to create multi-methods multi for closed sets of input types. So, Imagine you're in oop land, you have some base class collidable, and you have a bunch of types that inherit from collidable. And the problem is you want to see if two things are in collision. And all you know is that you have the collidable base class. So traditionally when you're doing oop and you want to do some kind of multi-method dispatch, you do multiple dispatch. So in other words, you have a virtual function that calls through, that one calls through another, another virtual function, and everything gets resolved. Alternatively, what you can do is if you know all of your types, you can go through and dynamic cast to each of the possible children. So what the library provides is, is another provider here called dynamic cast. And if you give it the list of all of your children, uh, you get, in this case, it's, it's linear over the amount of child types, an expansion of uh, basically like a variant visit. So you, you'll be able to check which of, if your objects are in collision, no matter which state it is currently in, out of box, sphere, and pill. What are the, um, the types of collidable 0 and 1? So collidable 0 and 1 uh, are just, uh, they can be uh, uh, pointers or references to a collidable. I should have shown the declaration there. So. They all have to be pointers or all variables? They all have all to be. Pointers or all references, so you cannot mix them. Uh, you, 
So these are two different statements. Like this one could be a pointer, in which case this will result in a pointer that's cast. It, it, logically, like not not immediately, because this is just a, an expression that's, yeah. But and then same thing with this one. This one could be a reference. So if you, if you were to do that, then you'd be passing along a pointer and a reference. So you'd probably want to be consistent because your collision function probably takes two references. So in practice, you'd probably want to take references. Gore. Uh, what is the return type of the reference? What is the return type? So uh, here, so I've oh, oh oh return type of dynamic cast. It is an it is an unspecified type that acts as a placeholder. You have ways of accessing the, the type in the library by way of result of dynamic cast. You can also use decal type, but it is an unspecified type. So these are basically expression templates. You can also use this dynamic dispatching method for a std any. So similar to the dynamic cast, I have an any cast. This is different from std any cast, but it works the same way as, as our previous example. So let's say you have a std any and you have your collidables. This time you don't have a base class because oops stinks. And you're going to put a box in your any and you're going to put a pill in your any. And you want to see if these two things are in collision. Once again, we have this, this type list of all things that you know at compile time are possibly going to be stored. And this time, we can't use a dynamic cast. This actually ends up using a, um, right now it's, it does a, a a logarithmic lookup. So it, it basically at compile time, it will get the type ID of all of these things, put them into an array, and sort them and do a lookup based on type index. So this will be able to, to check whether these two types are in collision. Hypothetically, you can do it in constant time, but I don't have that implemented currently. So. Uh, two really big questions. Uh, does it depend on specializing a multi-method? Specializing a multi method, no. So, so all this, all this uh, purely does is this will uh, figure out which one of these things it is, and it will cast up. And this in collision function is going to basically dispatch out to things that are overloaded at compile time. So it's, it's however your, your compile time in collision function will work. A box in a sphere. So when you put something in an any cast, it's always going to give you the dynamic. When you do the cast, it'll always give you the, the dynamic type of the object. So if you're saying that there's something that derives from both of them, it wouldn't match either of them. It would match the most derived type. How do you sort the type IDs at compile time? I don't sort the type IDs at compile time. So the question was, how do you sort the type IDs at compile time? The answer is, you don't sort the type IDs at compile time, but you do it at, uh, at you know when it's first initialized. That's unfortunate, but uh, hypothetically, if you wanted to create a multi-method facility, this library allows you to do it. And if you were intrusive to your types, you can make something equivalent to this very easily, and I'll show you how later on, that will just be able to interact with an intrusive ID that you can provide, which you would be able to sort at compile time. You'd be able to do something more efficient than simply getting a type ID. And it'll work even if RT, uh, RTTI is, is disabled. So, Victoria. Uh, Right. So, and that's usually my stance. Is you usually want a variant. The reason why you might sometimes want to do this is if if you do not it, basically if you want it separate in a separate translation unit, and if you don't want to recompile and you don't need you don't want the overhead of the variants and all the different instantiations and whatever. So there there are reasons for this, but I do tend to agree with you that. In 99% of the cases, any is the wrong choice. <laughs> but there, there, there are legitimate reasons to use it. And if you are in that situation, or if you disagree with that rationale, then this is what you'd do. But I do agree. You should prefer, you should prefer, bleh, prefer variants overall. So another way to describe this, and I mentioned this before, is this library is an expression template library. So uh, people are already familiar with Boost Phoenix and Boost Lambda, I'm sure. So can anybody tell me what? an expression in something like boost lambda or boost phoenix yields. What, like, what, what is represented here? In other words, if I write something like underscore one plus underscore two. Right. So it basically represents a function. So the result of all of your expressions there represent a function. 
Similarly, we have libraries like Boost Ublast, Eigen, or Blitz. Does anybody know what these represent? What was that? Matrices, yeah, or yeah, tensors. There's also Boost Spirit. What do these represent, these expressions that you form? Parsers. And so this library, what do you think that an expression, something like prov active alternative of, uh, yields? What was that? Result. Results. So a callable. Uh, callable. Function arguments. That's exactly correct. So basically, all of the expressions that you form, those little things like prov, access tuple, they represent a some type of argument lists. But call is, I think even call is in the thing actually invokes it. No, no, no. Oh, sorry, no. So in other words, the actual sub expressions, like the prov things. And so finally, call is basically just a natural extension to what we already do with function calls. So to kind of stress that point, I'm just going to show you some very simple code that we all take for granted. We don't think is magical. We don't think is, is very weird. So start. This is the simplest uh, code example I think I have on any of my slides. You just have a function foo, and you're calling it with three arguments. There's nothing weird here, right? Similarly. In C++ without libraries, we can, we can compute transform values at the, at the call site. So in this example, we just have some function next, just takes an integer and returns an integer. And we're effectively just modifying the value of this argument. So here we modified a 1, and it became a 2 at the call site. It's one way to look at it. Similarly, we, we can change types at the call site. So in this example, we are doing a lexical cast from one to a string. And so we're effectively calling foo with this type transform thing and the remaining arguments. So in the call library, we can do an extension of that. Here, we're able to transform multiple values from single, a single value to multiple values. So here we expand out one argument to multiple. And we're also able to do type transformations where we don't even know which type we're converting to at compile time. All we need to know is the full set of types that we may be converting to at compile time. So going through again, normal argument transformations in C++ without libraries, you can transform one or more values to a different value. You can transform a type to a different type. The exact type that you're targeting must be known at compile time. You can transform a single argument to a single argument. It doesn't require any library support in C++. Now, argument transformations with the call library are pretty similar. You can transform one, one or more values to a different value. You can transform a type to a different type. The set of possible types must be known. You can transform a single argument to many arguments, but it requires library support in C++. So there's really not very many differences between what we do with library and without library support. The only thing is that this fact here is that you have to know the exact type of conversion when you're not dealing with the library, and you only need to know the set with this. And you can also transform uh, to many arguments rather than just to a single argument. Uh, I've always thought of arguments as a series of small expressions that need to be evaluated by the compiler. And so you're just really looking at a bunch of little expressions that are then created before the function is actually invoked. But that's sort of different on the side where you're saying, actually, this is expanding the number of arguments there. That's, it's, it's very different. Yeah, it's a very, I'm talking in the abstract here. So effectively, what you're doing is, obviously, at, at, at compile time, if I go back to something like this, you're still converting one argument to one argument, because this obviously only has one result. I'm just talking about in the abstract, eventually, this is going to expand, or well, this is a poor example. Let me go back to this one. It's obviously still one argument, but in the back end, it's going to correspond to multiple arguments. And it's just you can do that with one single expression. That's all I'm trying to say. But yeah, I, I mean, obviously, it's still only going to expand out to one argument because we're not modifying the language, it's just a library. So is the call lob library really that novel? Uh, so. If you've worked in dynamically typed languages, most of this you know, just comes for free, or you don't care about it, because you're always working with the dynamic type of things. 
Uh, many statically typed languages already have direct support for tuple unpacking. C++ is kind of weird in the fact that it doesn't. Uh, the Clay programming language can expand out variants at the call site. But some aspects of this library that I haven't gone into yet are genuinely novel. So I'm going to go into a, a brief history of algebraic data types in C++ and how we got to where we are today. So in the early 2000s, uh, boost got, boost tuple, boost optional, boost variant. Uh, took quite a while before we got our next standard. And eventually, something very similar to boost tuple made it into the standards as std tuple. And now we're getting std variant, std optional, std apply, std visit in C17. We have existing proposals to get even more algebraic data types into the standard. There's std expected by Bicente Botet. Uh, this is basically just uh, like a, an, an either monad that gives you an expected result or, or some kind of failure principle. Uh, we also have a proposal for doing tuple-like variadic, to getting tuple-like variadic template facilities. Uh, this is by uh, Mike Spertis. And David Sankel has a paper for uh, language level support for variants in the language. Uh, Michael Park, who's here right here, has a library-based pattern matching, uh, a pattern matching library, which you can find at this site. So the point I'm trying to make here is that interest in algebraic data types in C++ is, has been increasing very steadily and consistently over time. And uh, ultimately, while we're introdu introducing types, we're not introducing enough facilities that allow us to interact with them in, in the ways that we need to. The fact that we have to do things like uh, jump through hoops to serialize and deserialize variants, for example, is just kind of ridiculous. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my, my personal exposure to algebraic data types. It started with variant. Uh, boost variant was accepted into Boost in 2003. I very quickly latched on to Boost variant, and it, uh, I use it basically in my my day to day work. Uh, it was an amazing feat that it was even implemented because it was in 2003 when we didn't have variatics, we didn't have lambdas, we didn't have anything like that. So it just did a whole bunch of preprocessor metaprogramming to generate all the possible uh, numbers of of, of uh, variant alternatives. Uh, it was unfortunately very frustrating to use. Uh, visitors had to inherit from this thing called static visitor, and you had to specify your return type explicitly because we had no return type deduction. Sometimes you ran into the issue where you needed to expand just one of n arguments from a variant, which was the types of situations that I was showing earlier. And this was actually really difficult to do, especially back then. We didn't have any language level lambdas, so uh, you basically just had to manually create function objects, and they had to inherit from this st static visitor. Even in C11, we didn't have a, a great solution to this because we didn't even have generic lambdas. So, uh, back in 2005, I got frustrated with this, and I made my own visit facility, which looked something like this. And it's a little bit, it's pretty similar to what the call library is right now. So it was visit, took a visitor, took a bunch of variants or things that aren't variants, and anything that wasn't a variant, it would just pass through as normal, and anything that was a variant, it would expand. Eventually, I ran into the case where sometimes I needed to pass along variants unexpanded, and uh, if anybody's used uh, the Boost Lambda library back in the early 2000s, uh, you encountered a similar issue if you were dealing with higher order functions and you were passing along bind expressions or lambda expressions and you didn't want them to expand. So the Boost library introduced this facility called Boost Protect. Uh, and it prevented expansion for one layer when you were expanding through. I took the opposite approach with my, uh, with my syntax and I just said, OK, I'm going to make my, my visit function take a visitor. And anything that I want to expand, I overloaded the unary plus operator for it. And this would basically just correspond to accessing the active alternative of the current of that specific variant. And then everything else would pass through normal. I also supported explicitly passing in a return type. So standardization of, of std variant started in about 2014, was when the, the papers first started to appear. Uh, it was very, uh, very different from existing implementations. It introduced uh, an intrinsic empty state, inconsistent uh, semantics with the proposed state optional. Some of this has been resolved, some of it hasn't. Uh, I was very upset about the, the direction that it was going, and I started interacting on the mailing list. It wasn't very helpful, so I started attending meetings. And eventually, I just decided to pr propose this new form of visit. 
And so the first form of uh, this proposal, I started writing in early, 2000, or, or early 2016. And when I was writing the proposal, I accidentally typoed an extra ellipsis. And when I typoed the extra ellipsis, I realized that uh, it still worked. And it was obvious that it would still work. And I realized that if I just left the dot, dot, dot there, I could extend the proposal out to work with tuples or anything more general than that. So I included that as a feature, and I submitted the paper. But I decided I'm only going to look for feedback. I didn't submit it as, a pro as an actual proposal for C++17 or anything. <laughs> so the status of the library currently is that it's in research mode. I'm expecting to propose it for Boost. And my long-term goals are to pick out the essentials, revise the paper, and possibly propose a language-level solution uh, instead of the library solution that I have right now. OK, so user-facing concept, concepts of the call library. So this will start to get into a little bit of the details of the guts of the library. So if we decompose what's going on here, we have a tuple, we make a tuple, and we have a call expression. Passing an argument, stood C out. And we're unpacking, the, we're unpacking the tuple. So if we look at this right here, we've already decided this is a tuple-like. We already know this. What this library introduces is an actual concept for a tuple-like type that you can map to by specializing traits. Tuple-like represents product types. It can be modeled by std tuple, boost fusion containers, and adapted structs. If you, if you do take advantage of that, then all of a sudden you'll be able to use prob unpack with anything that you have adapted. I also introduce a union-like concept. It represents some types that do not have a coupled discriminator. You can use this if you have a union and you have your discriminator, your discriminator stored in some separate location, but you still wish to do certain types of operations on that union. It's logically modeled by C++ unions, but the, and it usually appears, as I said, uh, in conjunction with some other higher level discriminator. Really, variant-like is the main concept that you're going to be looking at, which refines the union-like, and it just includes additional discriminator access. So the reason why these two concepts are separated out is that some of the providers that I have not yet shown do not require the full requirements of, of, of a variant-like type. They do not deal with the discriminator. And so this was introduced as a means to avoid that restriction. Expected would be variant-like. So anything with a discriminator can be variant-like. An, an optional can be variant-like. Um, expected can be variant-like. Variant is obviously variant-like. Uh, and if you create your own union and you have a, a discriminator attached, you can actually create a, a specialization and map it to that. And all of them, if you do that, then you will be able to use things like active alternative of, and you'll be able to visit your, uh, your, your variant-like type in a call expression. Yeah, and so here are some other examples. Boost, Boost Gil, any image is another example. If you're not familiar with Gil, it's the generic image library in Boost, and they have a variant concept of images, and it's called any image. It's same, basically the same thing as a variant, except everything that you put into it must be a compliant image type. Uh, yeah. Can optional expand into one or zero arguments? Not with the variant-like concept, but if you want to do that, you can do that with this library as well. And uh, to repeat the question, the question was, can optional exp expand to zero or one argument? And the answer is that if you're considering it modeling variant-like and you're using it with active alternative of, that will not be the case. It will give you back um, the T or a null opt as a single argument. But you could actually make a, a prov expression that will yield no arguments if it's, in the, if it's in the empty state and one argument if it's not. So. Going further, decomposing the call site. The next thing we're going to look at is this expression right here, this sub-expression, prob unpack of tup. And it's called an argument provider. So argument provider is a concept that is represented in the library. And it, this is the thing that represents the some type of argument lists in the, uh, in the, uh, in the expression template library portion of this library. Um, an example model of that is the return value of prob unpack. Another example would be the return value of prov active alternative of. All of these things just yield models of this concept, but they're all distinct types. Uh, a, an important thing to understand is even though I describe it as a sum type of argument lists, this is a very abstract notion. Just because it says that it's a sum type of argument lists 
that does not mean that it actually contains something like a variant of tuples or anything of that sort. In fact, like the return value of unpacked tup, it only represents a, some type of one argument list, and all it contains is a reference of the tuple that you passed in, and it will perfect forward it along. Similarly, if you use prov active alternative of, this, all this does is it captures a reference, and it just retains the knowledge that you are trying to unpack it, and you can examine its structure to determine what hypothetical some type it represents. The next thing that we're really going to look at is this function object right here called unpack. This is what I call an argument provider generator. And all that an argument provider generator is is a fancy name for an invocable that returns an argument provider. So you can just think of this as like a concept alias. It doesn't add any additional semantics. It's just useful for vocabulary because there are certain higher order function objects that require you to take argument provider generators. So let's go through some of the, the argument provider generators that we've seen so far. First and most obvious one is unpack. It takes as a parameter type a tuple-like type. Uh, it represents a reference to each element. And its argument count is equal to the element count of the tuple-like type. And the possibility count, so this is the number of alternatives in the hypothetical sum type, is 1. So in other words, it is a sum type with one of, of one alternative. And that one alternative, an alternative is effectively an argument list of length n, where n is the element count of the tuple-like type. The next thing we can look at is active alternative of. It takes a parameter of type uh, variant-like. It represents a reference to the currently active alternative of that variant. Uh, this one, the things are swapped. The, the sum type that it represents has n different possibilities, and the argument count is always exactly 1, which is corresponding to the currently active uh, alternative. Looking, going further, we can see access tuple. It takes a tuple-like and an integral. And what it represents is a reference to the nth element of the tuple. It has an argument type or an argument count of 1 all of the time. And much like prov active alternative of, uh, it ha the amount of alternatives in the represented sum type is equal to the length of the tuple, or the, the number of elements of the tuple that you give it. Here's a less interesting uh, argument provider generator that the library has. It's called prob value of. And it's basically just a way of binding a bunch of objects into a single object that represents a complete argument list. So when you call prob value of, it can take any number of objects, contains them by value. It represents an argument list of size uh, of the number of objects that you pass it. And it's a sum type of size 1. And corresponding to value of, we also have reference to, which contains references. And it perfect forwards the references along. So looking deep, deeper in detail on what the argument provider concept actually is, uh, it's a very simple concept has exactly one associated function template. And all that associated function template is is provide. It's called provide. It takes, as a first argument, uh, an instance of itself. So in the case of prov unpack, it would take an instance of the result of prov unpack as an argument. And it takes this thing called an argument receiver as the second parameter. And users never actually interact with this. This is all done internally in the library. But these are the, the fundamentals of how it works. So this argument receiver here is another concept. And it only has, well, it has two associated function templates. They're called receive and branch. And effectively, the way this works is all that provide does in the, its implementation is it calls one of these two functions. If, and and the, the purpose of these functions is that it communicates the arguments that are going to be passed at runtime. And it also communicates the rest of the structure of the variant type that it represents. So if you, if you are using something like prov active alternative of, then the provide function, what it will do is it will call branch here. It'll pass in itself. It'll, well, it will pass in the arguments receiver that it received. The leading argument types are any of the preceding alternative types of the variant before the index of the one that is currently active. Then it receives a provider of that active element. And then it receives a type list. These are compile time type lists of all of the trailing alternative types. 
And so what we effectively do is we communicate the entire structure of our hypothetical variant type across this visitation function. So knowing these concepts, we can look at the call function and try to figure out how it's implemented. Uh, to simplify the problem, if you can imagine that call impl is just a simpler version of call that only takes a single function object and a single argument provider, then you can go ahead and implement a call if you have some way of combining n different argument providers into a single one and forward along the implementation down to call impl. So this is an argument provider that I haven't uh, mentioned before, which is called prov group. And it's just a way of concatenating a bunch of argument lists together to form a single argument list. And so an example of this is if you give it two argument providers, each with three different arguments, it basically represents a single argument list of the concatenation. Similarly, you can do it with something a little less trivial. You can do prov value of, and you can do prov unpack of, of a tuple. And you will result in a single argument list. And it just contains each of the elements individually. So pop quiz. So prob group is an associative operation taking two argument providers, and it returns an argument provider. What else is required for the argument provider concept to form something monoid-like with prob group? Units. Units, right. So you need some kind of identity value i. And uh, the idea is that whether it comes on the right side or the left side, it acts as an identity operation. And so the unit is, uh, is prob nothing. It represents an empty argument list. So if you call foo with prob nothing, it basically just generates uh, an empty thing. And so the question earlier about how you expand out an optional into zero or more arguments, there is a higher order function that I'll introduce later on that you will be able to pass in this prob nothing. And a separate alternative you could pass in value of. And you will get back something that, in one case, will be zero arguments, and the other case will be one argument. So understanding the semantics of, of prob group. The, the examples we showed before, none of them were branching. We didn't have uh, prob active alternative of or prob access tuple or anything like that involved. Uh, so it was kind of simple. But things get more complicated when you try to group two things, like two variants or a variant and uh, a tuple access. So does anybody have any idea of what type of some type of argument list this overall thing would represent? Tobias? Uh, tuple, tuple of, say that one more time. Variant of tuple ACB, tuple ACB. So you're saying that there are two possibilities then? Maybe. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's try to take it step by step. So the first, the first one, we have active alternative of. This represents effectively uh, some type of an argument list of A or an argument list of B, right? This represents the sum type of an argument list of C, an argument list of D. So now you have a better idea of what the overall thing might represent. Exactly, the, the Cartesian product. So what it actually represents is, is um, an argument or some type of argument list where each has two elements and there are four total alternatives. So this represents an argument list of AC or AD or BC or BD. And the currently active element is the one that represents BC. And again, the thing to keep in mind of all of this is it's not actually containing like a greedy variant of these tuple types. This is just an abstract representation that it kind of has a knowledge of. So that way, when it goes through to do the call expression, it knows which arguments to pass. <coughs> OK, so now assuming that we have this group function, we can implement this like this. But currently, we don't do any pass through of, of our existing arguments. So we have a couple of options to support pass through. We can state that any valid parameter type is just an argument provider that provides itself. In other words, we can have some kind of default definition of provide that just says, OK, if you have no overloaded thing, just provide yourself. 
Alternatively, we can wrap each argument that isn't an argument provider internal to this in a, a prov reference to. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits and drawbacks of each of these. Uh, in the original paper, what I did was this first approach, where I said that if you don't over, over, overload anything, assume that it's an argument provider and it goes through the same exact mechanisms as everything else. The problem with that is when you get into the realm of higher order functions, uh, you don't always want to capture things by reference. Sometimes you want to capture things by value. So the approach that I ended up taking was approach number two, which is that inside the call function, it will check at, for each of your arguments. If it is not an argument provider, it will turn it into one by turning it into a reference to. So it'll lift it into that space. Otherwise, if it is an argument provider, it just acts as an entity function. So I called this argument provider just default to reference to. And it does exactly what I described. So if you give it an argument provider, it returns the identity. Otherwise, it will wrap it. And so looking back at the implementation, we now have something like this. And then I actually made this variadic, so you can just write it like this. Now the call impl is much simpler, because now we only have to know how to deal with a function and a single argument provider, and then we can implement the rest of our, our function. But uh, I'm going to move on from that for now. But this is the, the, the basics of the, the lower level parts of the library. If you want to know more about how this works, at even the lower, lowest level, you can read the paper, which has a complete uh, implementation. This library produces a total of over 30 argument providers, including things like conditional. So conditional is exactly the kind of thing that you might want to use if you want to expand out an optional into, into one or more elements. What you do is you give it a, a, compile, or a runtime bool condition, and you give it a provider of what you want to happen if that bool is true, and you give it a provider of what you want to happen if that bool is false. And so if your condition is that the optional is in the engaged state, then you would give it a provider of the, of the element that is engaged. Otherwise, you can give it a provider that is prov nothing. And then you're able to compose these things where the function argument list will be 0 or 1. Similarly, there is prov 4, which uh, I don't actually have a use of, but I just threw it in there because it was fun and for research. <laughs> So it's exactly what you would think it is. It, it starts with an initial state and a predicate and a step and a provider generator that takes state as an instance as its argument. And what it does is it keeps on generating arguments until the, uh, the, the predicate is no longer satisfied. So we now have basically a Turing complete way of dealing with argument lists. <laughs> An integral constant. Uh, so that's from file time and generation. Let me take that back. You can actually do. No, yeah. So it is. It is a std compile time constant. Yeah, it is a std integral constant. Sorry. Yes. But you can use the library to convert between the two. So. Question. Yeah. Can you use that facility to uh, generate? Arguments to an initializer list constructor? To an initializer list constructor. So the question was, can you use this to generate arguments to an initializer list constructor? I think the only way I think the only way you would be able to do that is through level of indirection of a function call. So it would have to pass them as regular function arguments and then it would have to expand out. Because yeah, there's I don't think there's any other. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was asking. Yeah. Actually, do our initializer lists have? Uh, it wouldn't matter. I was going to say, do they have constructors in the normal way that? No, it's mostly it's just the compiler generates them. Yeah. But even if it had a constructor, you couldn't you couldn't use the constructor there as like a function that you could pass. So it doesn't really matter. Hmm? Well, you'd have to pass it to call, and you have no way of passing a constructor to call. Okay. You can you can you can now construct function objects as constructors, and because of the uh, copy revision. It, it, it'll, we can talk about it after. We'll talk about it after. <laughs> so now we can talk about composition of argument providers. So 
as I described before, if you create your function objects in a very special way, uh, natively, you're just able to start using these kinds of complicated um, uh, visitation facilities without having to do anything like use a higher order function. At least the user doesn't have to see it. So all of a sudden, interacting with variants and tuples is very natural to people who are not used to doing functional programming and dealing with lambdas all the time. So the, the basic way that this facility works is you create your function object. Uh, you inherit from the CRTP base, passing in your own type. And then you define this static run function. Uh, this should actually be uh, fight t, and there should be an instance here. I forgot to create an instance. So this is a typo. And then uh, you can create a variant and some concrete object, and you're able to use it just as if it was uh, the call function. Yes, there's also an adapt. I do not have a slide for it, but yeah, it's called adapt to call object. And so it effectively takes in an existing function, call, uh, function object. You can store it to an auto very easily, and then you're able to do the same thing. Uh, there is one slight drawback to that that uh, I'll bring up later. But this can actually do more than the adaptation. And it has to do with the way that there's, there's certain other functionality that I haven't shown yet. So. Uh, the next type of, uh, of argument provider that I'm going to describe is called transform. Uh, we saw this earlier in an earlier slide. I used the pipe operator. So the pipe operator is just a fancy way of writing this. So effectively, what happens is when you write prob transform, you give it an initial argument provider. It'll expand it out. And then for each element that's expanded, it will pass that to the next argument provider generator. So this will effectively do an unpack and then unpack all of the things that it unpacked. So if you have a tuple of tuples, you can use this to directly unpack the tuple of tuples. Alternatively, you can just use the pipe operator. Uh, and transform obviously doesn't have to be uh, uh, homogenous. And by that, I mean you don't have to pass two unpacks. You can have a tuple of variants. And you can unpack a tuple of variants by unpacking it and then passing each element along to the, active uh, to the active alternative function. And this will now call foo with the active alternative of A and D, uh, which correspond to A and D. Is this clear to everybody? Is anybody lost? Is it the same as the pipe? Yes, so this is the same as the pipe. So the pipe is, is just shorthand for this. Uh, in, the, in the paper, I exposed the pipe, and I still have the pipe implemented in the library. However, I've kind of moved away from using the pipe just mostly generally on principle because it involves using ADL. And if, you, if, you are, if your argument provider that you've created did not opt in to get support for the pipe operator, then it's not going to work. So anytime you make one of these things, if you wanted the pipe operator to work, you'd have to opt in. And so rather than doing that, I think I'm just going to you know, deprecate doing that and just always prefer using transform. Transform is also uh, uh, more efficient in the variadic case, which you'll see next. The variadic case, you can pass as many as you want. The pipe operator, since it's always binary, is going to mean that you're going to have a whole bunch of different function calls. And you're going to have the overhead of that. But this will be a single uh, transform. So yeah, because why not? So if you can imagine you have a tuple of tuple of variants. This is just showing off the, 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 the power of the composition facilities. It's, it's basically Compose. In the paper, it was called Compose. I, yeah. Yes. Uh, the reason why I call it transform is you're effectively transforming each of, the, uh, each of the arguments by passing it along to another thing. But Compose may have been but the, a better name. But the reason why I moved away from Compose is there is another function object that you can also think of as Compose. And I wanted to, to disambiguate between them, so neither of them use that name. So the next thing we're going to talk about is something called prov squash. And this is an argument provider generator that takes an argument provider of argument providers, and it returns the equivalent of grouping all of those internal argument providers together. So an example of that is if you have value of two unpacked things, it will effectively flatten it down to an argument provider of a single thing. And this will just invoke the following. And so if you've been following, 
These are all actually uh, monad-like operations. So if you think about this, the unit operation is prob value of. The bind operation that I showed earlier corresponds to a transform. You can think of the argument provider as effectively a list, and the transform takes in a, um, a, a, a function object that returns an argument provider, and it binds it. The squash operation is just the join. It's what was flattened here. And there's uh, a map operation, which I didn't mention, which I call list transform. These names have changed a whole bunch of times, and I'm not settled on them. But I find them convenient. The reason why I say this is monad-like as opposed to just a monad is these all form expression templates. And uh, some people like to have a very strict definition of monad in the sense that uh, you're, you're not switching between types for certain operations. And so this is kind of like my informal way of saying, yeah, it's not truly a monad, but it's monad-like. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, the argument provider lift call. So the idea of lift call is it takes an, an invocable and a series of arguments and or argument providers, and it returns an argument provider that provides the result of the call. So that's really verbose and impossible to read. So an example might make things a little bit more clear. So here we, you know, we have a box, a sphere, and a pill, a list, and we're, we're basically doing our, our any cast uh, provision. And what we're doing is we're lifting our call to, to checking if things are in collision. And we're passing in these arguments. And so what this does, unlike call, where call greedily evaluates, this effectively just forms something, of, something like a binding of this function with these expanded arguments. And it doesn't actually execute it until the argument provider is expanded. Similar to that, there's prov bind. And it is equivalent to squash of lift call. And if, if this isn't clear, this forms another monad. So there are actually two monads that live inside the argument provider concept. And they both use squash as their join function. So moving on to creating your own argument providers. So I'm going to look at prob unpack prob active alternative of prob access tuple, and we're just going to implement them from scratch. Or not exactly from scratch, but from very low level argument providers that are included with the library. We're going to start with active alternative of. So as a refresher, active alternative of, what it is is it's an argument provider generator that takes a variant like, and it returns an argument provider of the currently active alternative. So as an example, you have a triangle and you have a square. You put them each in the variant. And you get prov active alternative of that polygon, and it's drawing a square. So how might we build this if we were building this from the, compo the composition facilities that we uh, were shown earlier? So the first thing we need is a way to access a variant-like type using a compile time index represented in a function argument. The next thing we're going to need is a way to access the value of the currently active index of a variant-like. Then we're going to need a way to transform an argument from a runtime index to a compile time index. And we're also going to need a way to compose these operations together. So the first thing we're going to look at is a way to access a variant like type using a compile time index. So as I said earlier, I have concepts that describe um, variant like types. And as a part of those concepts, I, I include traits. Uh, one of the traits for variant access is equivalent to stdget, except instead of taking a compile time constant 0 or a compile time constant integer as the template argument, what it instead does is it takes a std integral constant as an actual function argument. And the reason why you want to do this is it makes it uh, easily to be passed to, easy to be passed to higher order functions. Uh, this is not a function object, uh, but <laughs> this is, or rather, this would be a function object for exactly one thing. But this is a function object for everything, it's a, and it has an overload. Uh, and the other difference is that this facility is explicitly intended for customization. You're not really supposed to be customizing std get, but you are intended to customize this, which is why the, uh, all of the variant-like facilities interact with this instead of this. OK, so now we have a way to access variant-like type using a compile time index. Uh, the next thing we need to do is 
we need a way to access the value of the currently active index of a variant like. This is trivial. We have a dot index function. Then we need a way to transform an argument from a runtime index to a compile time index. And for that, I have a facility that is called prov variant index. And all this does is it takes in the variant like type and it takes as a runtime parameter a runtime integer value. And it generates a corresponding std integral constant in the range of 0 to the size of the variant like type. So here's an example of that. You start with your variant like type, v. And you have some index i that's not a compile time constant in the range 0 to variant size. Here, this has three elements. And this is the, basically the last element of the variant. And now when you use call with call on foo with the variant index v of i, you will get back a call to foo with the std integral constant with the value 2. Does everybody uh, understand what's going on here? Does anybody not understand what's going on here? Is there a way to, uh, um, more generally, to just say call foo pass 3 and have that uh, you know, translated back to a std integral constant? So the question was, is there any way to just have it so you can pass in the actual value 3 and have it give back an actual integral constant? I, I mean, that's not really possible for an integer because the number of, it, it, if it doesn't know what variant type you're talking about, the total range of values would be the total range of 0 to max int. Yeah. So it, uh, I don't, even with compiler intrinsics, you would not be able to do this. Yeah, because you would, yeah, you'd effectively have to instantiate, uh, you know, two to the power of sixty-four different uh, std integral constants. <laughs> My point is that if the compiler provided a magical type that could do that, because it doesn't actually need to do it, because it well, knows how it behaves. But it 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 does actually need to do it though, because yeah, <laughs> because you're, you're passing along the result. Yes, but if you had special code in the compiler to generate that type and gave it a name. But the, right, there's no way that. Oh. Right, it has to be able to forward along the std integral constant, and if it doesn't know the range, and the the value is coming in at runtime, that <laughs> integral constant can be anywhere from zero to max int size, which would mean that it would have to just at compile time generate all the possibilities. Okay, right. So that's why you need something like this. Uh, so, it, yep. It's it basically is yeah. So so it it basically it, all this does is is it creates an argument provider that establishes a range of values that can potentially be converted to. So it it basically says I know that i is going to be in the range of zero to to variant size v. So when it provides, it's able to do the visit on only zero through. Through, zero through two inclusive, I guess. So finally, we need a way to compose all the operations. We actually saw what this was. So let's start out with looking at what Active Alternative of does right now. Okay, so what is going on behind the scenes when you? try to access the active alternative of a variant. This is basically the expansion that we did with the switch statement, right? How can we represent this with a single argument provider behind the scenes? Can anybody come up with an implementation of what this call would do? Some kind of switch with the continuation. I'll, I'll, I'll give a hint. So you don't have to write any, any imperative code like a switch. You can do this entirely with the types of facilities that are mentioned here. A composition facility, something like uh, the, the variant index, 
Exactly. So what Jackie has stated was you, you, you access the variance index, you convert it to a compile time constant, and then you use that compile time constant to access um, the variant. And so do you, do you know which facilities you might use to do this? Yeah. Uh, well, you have to compose these actions. Um, yeah, you know, transform. Uh, <laughs> and I guess the existing uh, providers are Impact, uh, Transform, uh, let's see. And then, yeah, I'm having trouble visualizing that, like the syntax or. Get real mm -hmm. variant traits yeah. get. Yeah, you, all, you will need variant traits get. That's, that's a good point. So effectively, what you want to do is you want to call variant traits get with this converted index. So is there a way to do that? It's a variadic expansion. Here you go. So when you say call it directly, what do you mean call it directly? So, so well, very. We're not actually accessing the element here. We're trying to. We're trying to create a binding of the argument provider. Yeah. Right. So there is the one, the one that was uh, take the like result, but give it to me as the provider. Like, mm -hmm. Take the result of this call, right? And yep. Lift, was it lift call or no? Yeah. It was lift call, right? Okay. So what you're effectively doing is you're lifting a call to variant traits get giving it a reference to the variant. And you give it index provider. I just have this separated out. But all that is is the variant index. So that's exactly correct. So all you do is you lift the call to the get, give it the variant, and then the provided index. And if we decompose this a little bit further, the way that variant index is, com is created is there's a lower level uh, argument provider called value in range which takes a range of 0 to some constant size. These are passed as compile time constants. And all we do to create variant index is it's basically just an alias of this that does the same thing. So now that we know effectively how to construct this, if you just turn back around, we can create active alternative of effectively from scratch, if it didn't exist, by just a single line of lift call to a call to get passing a reference to the variant and the variant index. And this is pretty close to exactly what the implementation of active alternative of looks like. So we just implemented it to visit in a single statement, which is pretty cool. So expanding on this, just for completeness, all of the uh, argument provider generators in the library are actually function objects. And we know this because we were able to pass them along to things like transform. Uh, so we're just going to convert this one over to function object. And finally, to make it fully complete, we're going to want to make this perfect forward. So these are the things that have to change. And that's all we have to do. There's this little unqualify thing here. All that does is remove uh, CV and ref qualifiers. And everything stays the same. So the only thing that's actually missing here now is that there's an automatic deduced return type. Uh, and in the actual implementation, this is uh, constrained. Currently, it's constrained by effectively implicit uh, substitution failures. So it's a, a result of operation that builds off of these. So right now, this will give you a hard error if you, mis if you make a mistake. But in the actual implementation, it just causes substitution failure, for instance, if you did not pass in a variant-like type. Uh, unqualify versus decay. So decay does a little bit more than unqualify. So uh, all unqualify does is remove reference, remove const. Uh, what decay does is that, but it also decays functions to function pointers, and rates arrays to array uh, to, to pointers to the first element. So this is more just for pedanticism. I, I provide it because I find it useful. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit unfair to say that that's implemented to get. I mean, it's to visit. Right, because it's built up upon the. Well, I mean, it also only does single visitation. Does it, though? Right, well, as, as stated right, so far. It actually, so 
the, the comment was, doesn't it only do single visitation? And the answer is, imagine you just have a call and you just invoke active alternative with multiple different elements. That will work with this, and that is the equivalent to a visit with multiple types. If we wanted to make it, it, it sure, sure, you, sure. You, yeah. So if you wanted to make it truly equivalent and have absolutely uh, no overhead versus the, the visit version, you could make this very attic. You'd get the same overall semantics as if you had multiple calls to uh, active alternative of for different arguments. But you would be able to do, use tricks like make a context per table that has uh, n dimensions, mm -hmm. as opposed to a bunch of separate ones that have one dimension. But the semantics wouldn't change. So this really does, this really is all you need to get a, a, an n -ary visit. And an, in addition to that, not only is it an n -ary visit, but you can use it in combination with unpacking, can go anywhere in an argument list and pass through. So it actually does a little bit more. So what have we learned from this example? Well, what we learned is that visit can be implemented as a one-liner argument provider. Argument providers can be easily composed. Lift call can create an argument provider from a normal function and arguments from one or more argument providers. And the library provides some low-level argument providers. I've only showing, shown you a few of them. but. Almost anything you can think of that involves converting from a, a runtime value to a compile time value can be done using this library. And I'll go into some more details about exactly what other argument providers there are that allow you to do this. So we implemented active alternative of. So let's move on to a more interesting one, or something that seems more interesting, which is access tuple. This is one that we don't currently have I think it's time for break. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <Cliffhanger ending. laughs>